A national tour is planned to coincide with the release of their debut album, and business-minded guitarist Harry Lyon has several ambitious ideas on how to execute it. His forward-thinking approach goes on to inspire a new era of professionalism on the Kiwi music scene. I was approached by a woman called Angela Griffin, who worked for a company that represented Coca-Cola. And so I said, what we need to do is we've got this album coming out, we need to do like a one-nighter tour and have PA, like the international bands and stuff, in the pub zone. And Coca-Cola, I'd had a little think of it before, and I said, our first single was out a year or so ago through RCA, as it was then. It was called Rum and Coca-Cola. Maybe we could call the tour the Rum and Coca-Cola tour. And their eyes just lit up, you know, they thought that was great. And, and did a bit of, we did a bit of budgeting on what was involved in the PA and all the rest of it, and they said, okay, it might be a bit big for us, but we'll talk to Karuba and Wright Cars. So they got Karuba, Rum and Coca-Cola, and Wright Cars for the transport. So, you know, all of a sudden we become corporate. <laughs> unwittingly. And it, it meant that obviously a lot of our costs were covered, which was good, and you know it worked like a gem for the album, it, you know, it sold really well and charted, we had heaps of airplay, so it was lots of fun, <laughs> plus we got two dozen bottles of rum delivered to us every other day, <laughs> so um, you know that kept things fairly well oiled. The Rum and Coca-Cola tour goes on to become a roaring success, bringing over $30,000 to the band's coffers and effectively establishing a new touring circuit, soon to be followed by the next generation of Kiwi acts. So it did, I guess the Rum and Coca-Cola kind of helped create the pub circuit as, as it became known. Yeah, always had that underground thing, you know, which university circuit, etc. But to actually go out there and do it to the greater Joe public, it hadn't happened really since the 60s, you know, so they, they opened up a lot of doors. It's 1978, and the band, now topping the local charts, decide it's the right time to head to more lucrative markets. New manager David Gapes has a plan. Instead of following the traditional route of touring Australia, the band think big and head direct to Hollywood instead, an international deal firmly in their sights. At the time, all New Zealand music fans were looking to see bands succeed overseas, so just as we were excited about Spidens going to Australia and London and USA, we were really excited and possibly thought that Hello Sailor going to um, Los Angeles would be the big breakthrough, so we were keeping a close eye on that. LA was a lot like Auckland in the, in the way, when I say LA, Hollywood was a lot like Auckland. All the major record companies were there and there were about five or six venues that were very similar to the Auckland pub venues like the Glue Pot. They're the clubs that everybody knows about, the Troubadour, the Roxy. There's a list in the Troubadour, I'm sure it's still there, of people that have performed there. When you're playing in these places, you're playing on the same stage as your heroes and stuff, you know. So. The chances of um, your career sort of taking a significant step in some sort of direction seem a little bit closer than, bless its heart, but playing the glue pot, you know. We were gaining a following. Um, we were playing regularly with the Knack. We'd do, in America, you'd do two shows a night, you know, you swap round. They'd do the early show, we'd do the late show. Both bands would play, then they emptied everybody out and do it all over again. Guys like the Dead Boys, the Ramones, people like that used to come to our house. We were pretty friendly with all those cats. Johnny Thunders was a close friend of mine, without name dropping, but we, we were right in the middle of that whole, like 1978 LA punk scene. So begins a hedonistic period for the band as the sailors live it up amongst the rock star excesses of Sunset Strip. Unfortunately, along the way, the band and their entourage start to pick up some nasty habits. Like 
like people in that business, they do, do tend to behave excessively where things like drugs and women are concerned. We were young men, we were in our um, early to mid twenties. First time we'd really been out of New Zealand for any, you know, we just had fun. Yahoo, party party. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, stories always get blown out of proportion. It wasn't as bad as, you know, the stories are. But, you know, we were just, I mean, most people were just, in our, in our band, our sort of circle were mostly just dabbling, you know, whatever. It was just, it's what you did in the 70s and 80s, you know, you, you, you tried everything. And some people got stuck in it and some people didn't. <laughs> But we were also honing our craft. We were writing new songs. We did tracks produced by um, Earl Slick, who's David Bowie's guitar player. Um, we worked with Ray Manzarek. Ladies and gentlemen, a chap who just sneaked up onto the stage, one Ray Manzarek. Yeah. what came about because Ray Manzarek's personal assistant was um, scoring drugs off someone that we knew and the guy turns out to be Danny Sugarman who wrote that book No One Gets Out of Here Alive and he was you know um, very talkative and full of stories and we eventually learnt that he was he'd been Jim Morrison's personal assistant and so he linked us up with Ray. He learnt the Blue Lady um, riff in the middle, the breakdown, the middle eight part, sort of like perfectly. It was like he had it all scored out. It was like classically, he had all these classical figures, these arpeggiated sort of things. And um, yeah, it was all structured completely. Manzarek takes a particular shine to the talents of sailor frontman Graham Brazier and invites him to join The Doors as a fill-in singer to tour their American prayer release. Amazingly, Brazier declines. I always knew, and so did the band, that nothing would ever come of it. Deep down, I mean, it was a nice idea. It was a um, hell of an honour, really. But that wasn't where Hello Sailor was at. It wasn't what they were all about. And Graham decided for himself that it was too much, you know. Um, you know, Graham's not good with pressure, and. Um, and also, his loyalty is for him is a big thing, you know. So, but we would have um, gone with the idea, you know. He could have just gone and done it for six months, and then, but then what would have happened? <laughs> would have been, you know, curtains for how I say it or such. Isn't it? As the American experience wears on, the band's morale begins to spiral down. Simply put, the band need a recording contract, and it's proving more elusive than first anticipated. And we were talking to several record companies. Um, then the money ran out, the band got dispirited, and a tour to Australia was being talked about. So they decided to come home, a decision I disagreed with. We should have worked closer with David on, um, you know, because he was new to the whole game over there as well. But we really needed to know if we were going to indeed sort of sign a record deal and make an, make an album and do it properly. Um, so because that wasn't happening, we thought the best thing to do would be to separate from David. In retrospect, I'm not quite sure if it was the right decision, actually. I, um, um, however. And with that, the sailors set sail. Clearly they hadn't cracked the states as they'd hoped, but they definitely had a good time trying. I don't know how good it was for our health, <laughs> but uh, it was, a, I mean, it was just a great experience. And creatively, I think the band was 
really tight then, you know, we were living together and we were playing quite a lot. Did all, you know, we did some really cool things, played at the whiskey, played all these great places. Those kind of things are, are really cool, whether we, you know, had commercial success or whatever, I think we had creative success. Well, it was glorious and we had a great time, we saw a lot of things and uh, Graham wrote some great songs, but we didn't get that record contract. And my abiding feeling is a few more weeks there and we may well have done that. Before travelling overseas, the band had returned to Stebbings to record new material with Rob Aiken and Ian Morris once more at the helm. The result is Pacifica Amor, an album that failed to chart as strongly as its predecessor. The record was only really half written. Um, we, we didn't have enough songs and I think some of the songs were, were throwaway grooves. You know, you know they weren't, you know, the, Hello Sally had a, an ability to, to jam and get into good grooves. And I think we took some of those grooves and made them into songs where perhaps that they wouldn't have made the cut if they had been worked on skillfully as songs. You see, with the first album, you've got all that time, you've written all those songs when you've been growing up. There's what they call the second album syndrome. You know, you get, you do your first album, you've got all these songs that you might have written over a 10 year period. Then next year, you've got to come up with another album and you've got a year to write what you might have written in 10 years. You know, the energy's down from the first one. You know, the chemistry's down. The creative uh, spurts aren't there. You know, you've had your one shot. <clears throat> you've got to work really hard and carefully to make sure the second shot is, is just as good, if not better. Otherwise, your, the fickle public will reject it. Pacifica Amor represents a darker turn for the sailors, as the band absorbed the impact of several years of relentless touring, not to mention the sudden emergence of punk. The, our first album was a lot more eclectic musically. The second album came along 18 months later when we'd all been living the life of, of being a rock band on the road and the nightlife, whereas the first album wasn't so much the result of that, not completely. So it's a lot darker if you listen to it, listen to the lyrics and the imagery and stuff. It's, it's, it's um, not as accessible. Fatefully, the band also choose to release the album while based overseas. It's a somewhat overconfident move and their subsequent unavailability causes some headaches. We weren't around to promote it. We weren't here to tour it. Um, and it just you know, slid under the door, so to speak. Pacific Remorse, which died. It was, I mean, there's some great songs on that. Blackpool, I'm a Texan. Dr. Jazz, yeah, it's a great album. It's a, it's a good album. It just didn't have the exposure that it needed to be recognised. <laughs> 